Regent President Walsh? Here. Regent Vice President Bogust? Regent Adams? Present. Regent Atwell? Regent Brankus? Here. Regent Brankus? Here. Thank you. Regent Cologne? Here. Regent Jones? Here. Thank you. Regent Many Deeds? Oh, I'm sorry. Regent Cruiser? Present. Thank you. And Regent Many Deeds? Uh, Regent Miller? Here. Regent Peterson? Here. Regent Prince? Present. Regent Rye? Here. Regent Staten? Here. Regent Tyler? Here. Regent Underley? Here. Regent Walks? Here. And Regent Weatherly? Here. We have a quorum. Very good, thank you. As we consider items on today's agenda, are there board members who wish to declare any conflicts of interest regarding today's open session agenda? Seeing none, we will proceed. So welcome again to the meeting and many thanks to Chancellor Manukin and her fabulous team for their hospitality and hosting. Thank you for addressing the sound system in the union. Really appreciate that. Uh, to start us off today, uh, President Rothman has some introductions. Uh, thank you, Regent President Walsh, and good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Lynn Akey, uh, who started the new year as the seventh chancellor of UW Parkside. Chancellor Akey, who was unanimously approved by this board, comes to us from Minnesota State University, Mankato, where she served as a vice president for student success, analytics, and integrated planning. Lynn has a long history at the Mankato campus where she has served in a variety of roles since 2000. In her most recent position, she established a new student success approach that led to an increased re-enrollment, retention, and graduation rates. She has also overseen strategic planning at the university for the past 10 years. She was named Minnesota State System Academic and Student Affairs Administrator of the Year in 2021. Uh, and we are now pleased that she has decided to cross the border uh, and join us at the universities of Wisconsin. Her extensive experience uh, in student success makes Lynn a perfect fit for UW Parkside. She deeply understands how strategic planning, enrollment management, and the student experience work together. Dr. Aki earned her PhD in educational policy and administration at the University of Minnesota her Master of Arts degree in college uh, student personnel at Bowling Green State University, and her Bachelor of Science degree in psychology at Truman State University. We certainly get look forward to getting to know you better, Chancellor, uh, and we certainly offer you the opportunity to say a few words today. Chancellor, would you mind moving the mic a little closer? Thank you, perfect. Is there any mic assistance? Uh, no. So there's one that works. Teachers. More chance to turn it right here, I guess. Um, well, I just want to say thank you um, for the warm welcome to the Universities of Wisconsin. Certainly thank you to the Parkside community um, that's supporting my transition, the faculty, um, staff, and, and students. Um, and I'm honored uh, to be joining the Wisconsin team and leading at the University of Wisconsin Parkside. You know, Parkside is certainly a, a special place to live, learn, and lead. You know, coming first to, to know Parkside as the parent of a Parkside student, I really came to experience firsthand the appreciation of the access that that university provides. Really delivering on a mission to transform lives with one in three of our students being Pell eligible, just under half of our students being first generation students or the first in their family um, to graduate with a four year degree and being the most diverse campus within the universities of Wisconsin. Uh, I'm so very proud that UW Parkside is a community that's truly committed to demonstrating the transformative impact that higher education access and opportunity provides. 
I look so very much to contributing to our work together here within the system and leading at UW Parkside. So thank you for the welcome today. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to extend my sincere thanks to Scott Menke, who stepped up to serve as interim chancellor at UW Parkside after the departure of Debbie Ford. Scott has been part of the UW Parkside campus community for almost two decades, and his steady hand helped the university stay on course until Dr. Aki arrived. His willingness to serve in this role during a time of transition was very much appreciated, Scott, so thank you for that. Now I would like to recognize and welcome a familiar face, uh, but in a new role, Dr. Betsy Morgan, who has agreed to serve as interim chancellor at UW Lacrosse Cross while the university continues its nas national search for a new permanent chancellor. Betsy, whose time at Lacrosse goes back to 1993, has served as the university's provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs since 2017. Previously, she was a professor and chair of UWL's psychology department. Betsy holds a doctorate in social ecology from the University of California, Irvine. Uh, she is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and has authored two textbooks and several peer-reviewed journal articles. She has also presented at over 50 conferences nationwide. Uh, Betsy also has an extraordinary quick, quick wit so I do not get into a battle of wits with her, but we are absolutely delighted uh, that you have taken on this role and we'd like to certainly hear a few words from you as well, Betsy. Well, now I feel like I should be funny. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I was recently told I was too quippy. Uh, thank you, Jack Jablonski. Uh, so let me tell you that um, I wish, and, I, and I'm, this is very sincere, I wish that everybody in this room could have had the experience that I had about the first two weeks after being named and it was because uniformly every alum, the donors, the community partners, the parents, and the current students came forward and said, we believe in this campus and the strength of the UW system and in UW lacrosse, and we want to move forward. And it was really heartening to have people understand that we we're all greater than one person. And so it's been a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, also from UW Lacrosse, I'd like to welcome Carl Kunkel, who has agreed to serve as interim provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs in Betsy's spot. Mm -hmm. With more than two decades of higher education, Carl is the dean of the College of Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities at UWL, and was previously provost at Southeast Missouri State University. Carl, could you please stand so we could acknowledge? And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Tracy Dreyer, who has accepted the appointment as Interim Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration at UW Eau Claire. Previously, Tracy served as the university's Executive Director of Finance and Administration, as well as Chief Human Resources Officer. She has more than 20 years experience in higher education and joined the team at UW Eau Claire in 2019. Tracy, would you please stand so that we can acknowledge you? And with that, I will turn the floor back to President Walsh. Thank you, President Rothman. On behalf of the board, I wanna take an opportunity to recognize the outstanding service of a frequent visitor to our meetings over the years, and that is Bob Golden. Dr. Golden recently announced that he's stepping down as Dean of the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Bob, who served in that role since 2006, is one of the longest serving medical school deans in North America. And he's led extraordinary advancements in the educational research and service missions of the school. He reported annually to this board on matters related to the Wisconsin Partnership Program, a grant making program within the medical school committed to improving health and advancing health equity in Wisconsin through investments in community partnerships, education, and research. You may remember, in fact, that Bob spoke at our last meeting in December. I have many connections with Bob besides my work on the UW uh, Hospitals Board. 
um, as, uh, in the guise of philanthropy, Bob and I have also worked together and I have great respect for the way he has worked with hospital administration to make that relationship strong and effective. So many thanks for his service. We will wish him well in his future endeavors. The records of the board's regular and special meetings in December have been provided. Are there any corrections? Seeing none, the minutes are approved as distributed. Now we look for a report from the Wisconsin Technical College System, which has been provided to Regents. Are there comments or questions on anything in that group of minutes? All right, seeing none, we will let that stand as distributed. Starting with an update on the search for the next chancellor of UW Lacrosse. I'm pleased to report that the search and screen committee led by Regent Ashok Rai with Professor Inilda Delgado as the vice chair is preparing to interview semifinalist candidates later this month. The special regent committee, which includes regents Adams, Brunkus, Cruiser, and Prince, in addition to Regent Rai's chair, will then select the candidates who will be invited to visit UW Lacrosse as finalists in early March. I want to recognize and again thank all members of the search and screen committee for their time and dedication to this process. Regent Rai as chair, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Just want to acknowledge and thank the committee for all of the work it's taken to get to the semifinalist round. There's a lot of reading, a lot of, uh, a lot of reading. I'll just keep saying a lot of reading. Uh, and, uh, Looking forward to uh, later this month in the semifinalist round. We, from the looks of it, will have a great chancellor at UW Lacrosse coming forward. Yes, I think the campus is in good hands, and um, we will add our thanks to them. Uh, looking forward to seeing the results of the interviews. I'd also like to take this opportunity to remind everyone of two upcoming special events recognizing the appointment of two of our excellent leaders. First, UW-Whitewater will be hosting an investiture ceremony on February 23rd for Chancellor Corey King, who started his role last March. And during the board's upcoming meeting at UW-Platteville in April, we're looking forward to attending the inauguration of Chancellor Tammy Ivetovich, who was appointed last April after serving in an interim capacity since June of 2022. I'd also like to remind regents and others to save the date on Wednesday, March 6th for this year's Research in the Rotunda event. It's celebrating its 20th anniversary. This is a signature event for the universities of Wisconsin. It reflects a number of our key priorities in the strategic plan, including being a global leader in research, scholarship, and creative activity, as well as ensuring our undergraduates get hands-on experience in finding solutions to problems. If you were in the education meeting this morning and heard the testimony of those three student researchers, um, I think when I was their age, I was most concerned about could I win the beer pong game um, after their, their experience and honors and the breadth of their work is truly stunning. And you will see that up in the Capitol. It's one of my favorite activities to attend. More specifically on that latter point, our strategic plan has set a goal to increase participation in undergraduate research activity to at least 25% of the student body at each of our universities across the UWs. So on March 6th, we look forward to bringing together outstanding undergrad researchers from all of our universities together with their faculty advisors into the Capitol Rotunda to share their research findings on a variety of important topics with legislators, state leaders, UW alumni, and other supporters. For anyone who has not yet had the pleasure of attending, I strongly urge you to stop by. Ignore the parking problems. Go there. You won't be sorry. The students are amazing. An additional note, once again, students will have the option to produce a brief video about their research, which will then be featured on the Research in the Rotunda website that's run by UW System. So if you cannot make it to the Capitol, be sure to go online and check out some of the impressive work that's being done by our students. One final calendar item to bring to your attention. The one-day Board of Regents meeting previously scheduled for March 7th in Madison has been canceled. As such, our next regular meeting will be April 4th and 5th at uw Platteville. That concludes my report. President Rock. Thank you. Uh, let me start my report today with some legislative updates. As I expect you are aware, this has been a very active legislative session and the universities of Wisconsin 
have figured in a great number of pieces of legislation, several of which are still in process. With that in mind, let me give you an overview and some highlights. To date, the legislature has been moving forward on the actions called for by the agreement approved by this board in December. The first step forward was JOKER, or the Joint Committee on Employment Relations approval on December 19th of the UW pay plan, retroactive to July 2nd, 2023. This 4% and then 2% pay raise is so important for our hardworking employees, and we appreciate the work that's been done to finalize those increases. Additional good news, late last week, pay plan raises or pay raises were approved for the trades employees at UW-Madison and at UW System. I'd like to point out that the pay plan is consistent with our strategic plan and our commitment to increase compensation for our employees to be competitive with their peers. Another important piece of legislation we've been closely following relates to reciprocity. The bill on reciprocity will ensure that our campuses can retain the tuition differential when accepting reciprocity students from Minnesota instead of those dollars going directly into the state's general coffers, which had been the case previously. These additional funds will be a huge asset for our universities, especially those on the Minnesota-Wisconsin border like River Falls and uw Stout. This effort was specifically identified in our strategic plan reflecting our commitment to help our universities uh, retain the full benefit of the work that they're doing under the Wisconsin-Minnesota Reciprocity Agreement. As it relates to that le legislation, in fact, yesterday, the legislature's budget writing committee or the Joint Committee on Finance unanimously approved that legislation, so we are getting closer. As you probably know, there is a 2023-25 capital budget amendment uh, with nearly $700 million in capital funding being considered by the legislature as well. Among, other, among others, projects impacted by this bill include the new UW-Madison Engineering Building, UW-Whitewater's Winther and Paul and Heidi Hall renovations and replacements, and planned demolitions at many campuses, including Eau Claire, Green Bay, Madison, Milwaukee, and Platteville. This bill also will fund utility projects across the UW as well as resident hall upgrades at UW-Madison. This bill also unanimously was unanimously approved by the legislature budget writing committee yesterday and is again one step closer toward final enactment. Both of those bills, the capital budget bill and the reciprocity bill, as I said, were approved by JFC yesterday and now must be approved by the full legislature before being going on to the before uh, proceeding to the governor's desk. Additionally, we continue to work to advocate uh, toward the release of the $32 million in workforce supplemental funding, funding, which is yet to be considered by the Joint Finance Committee. The bill on guaranteed admissions is another legislative step still being discussed. The proposed bill will ensure Wisconsin staff students have a clear path to attend one of our UW universities. The bill currently needs to be voted on by the Senate and then concurred because it was amended uh, by the assembly. There is also legislative activity that's ongoing outside of the confines of our agreement with the legislature. A National Guard reimbursement bill is in the works. This legislation has received somewhat less attention in the big picture, but it's keenly important to Wisconsin's active service members. The bill would allow National Guard members to receive their tuition grants up front when that tuition is due to our universities rather than having to wait for reimbursement of fees paid after the end of the semester. This will help with managing students' cash flow and debt situation, making it easier for more Guard members to afford their college education and will hopefully encourage more of them to consider attending one of our universities. Again, this is aligned with our stated goal of our strategic plan to try to increase enrollment to meet the needs of the state uh, and the knowledge economy. That the rest of the, the bill for the National Guard was passed the assembly or passed the Senate unanimously and now awaits a vote in the assembly. Finally, as mentioned at the December board meeting, Wisconsin has been officially designated as a regional tech hub for biohealth with the universities of Wisconsin, a member of the consortium. This designation has great potential to not only expand our national leadership in biohealth technologies, but also to help grow Wisconsin's economy. To help support this initiative, a tech hub bill is currently being considered in the legislature, which would provide $7.5 million in state funding 
in a grant to BioForward, the lead member of the consortium. These state matching funds would help Wisconsin's manufacturing and supply chain companies develop apprenticeship programs and help fill gaps in high demand sectors. And yes, that too aligns with our strategic plan to encourage thoughtfully, but to engage thoughtfully with the employer community to identify and address employer talent support and research needs. The bill was recently voted out of the Joint Committee on Finance and moves next to a vote by the Assembly and the Senate. As I said at the outset, this has been a very active session and the universities of Wisconsin welcome the opportunity for ongoing collaboration and discussion with the state legislators. Now, let me talk about a few strategic plan updates. And I know you haven't heard me say the word strategic plan yet enough today. So I will continue with a few updates on our plan. Um, later this afternoon, we will hear from Monica Smith, the Associate Vice President for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and Belonging for the Universities of Wisconsin. Monica is working closely with university leaders to develop and share best practices to advance our strategic plan, including access to our universities and creating a sense of belonging for all of our students on campus, including first generation students, disabled students, veterans, students with differing political ideologies, students with differing religious beliefs, as well as those students from underrepresented groups. Tomorrow morning, UW-Madison will convene panelists to discuss the importance of strategic alliances and maximizing federal funding opportunities through public-private partnerships. This again aligns with our strategic plan's commitment to focus on being a global leader in research, scholarship, and creative activity, as well as knowledge dissemination that benefits society. It also aligns with strategy seven to foster a culture of innovation in support of advancing human knowledge and economic prosperity. As I said, that panel discussion is coming up tomorrow morning, and I think we can certainly expect an energetic and thought-provoking discussion. I would also like at this point to call your attention to our brand new Wisconsin online portal. Wisconsin online revamps our previous online presence to provide a one-stop shop for the existing online efforts at all 13 of our universities, each of which has a, uh, a student-friendly website promoting access to online learning. This new portal gathers more than 200 fully online programs offered at our UWs in one location. It is designed so students can search for programs uh, search for programs by program level, area of interest, and by campus. This site also has information targeting international students, military students, prospective undergraduate and graduate students, as well as transfer students. As the workforce continues to change, so will the delivery of education, including online. Looking ahead, Wisconsin Online plans to expand its program array with certificates, micro-credentials, and other innovations. This, of course, aligns with our strategic plan commitment to support student success by enhancing our online educational opportunities and expanding access to our UWs. I'd encourage you to take a look at it. It's available at online.wisconsin.edu. It really is a great site, and I would like to recognize and thank all of those who participated in this almost nine-month or even longer process, which is overseen by executive sponsors Chancellor Mark Money. Chancellor Renee Wachter and Vice President Johannes Britz and included representatives from each of our universities. I'd also like to thank the implementation team, which included reps from UW-Milwaukee and Oshkosh, UW-Extended Campus, and UW-Whitewater Provost John Chenoweth. We could not have done this without you, and this is a significant uh, advancement in my opinion. Now I'd like to talk about a few other accomplishments uh, from around the universities of Wisconsin. Last month, the universities of Wisconsin announced this year's recipients of UW innovation grants. Each of three winning proposals will now receive seed funding totaling up to $175,000 split over two years. The winning proposals selected for funding included the following. The UW Oshkosh College of Nursing proposes to develop and integrate curriculum to educate current and future nurses on the use of telehealth to impro improve rural chronic health illness outcomes. Secondly, five faculty members at UW-Stevens Point and a collaborator at UW-Madison earned a grant to improve Wisconsin soil through research on the removal of PFAS from soil using 
hemp and alfalfa. And finally, a team from UW Stout, along with a faculty member at UW River Falls, are developing a low cost wireless sensor network to monitor farm fields for temperature, humidity, wind, soil moisture, heat, and more. This information will then support farmers' decision-making processes. As these three projects develop, a review panel will select one big idea winner to receive additional fund funding totaling up to $400,000, which will be distributable over three years. I'd like to congratulate everyone involved in these projects. We've invested money in these grants because innovative thinking has the potential to make real and constructive change in people's lives and support the state's economic growth. And yes, it is consistent with our strategic plan. A couple of other shout outs. UW-Milwaukee recently announced that its UWM Foundation has received a $1.2 million gift from Microsoft to support the university's Connected Systems Institute. This gift will be used to educate and expand Wisconsin's talent pipeline for Industry 4.0 manufacturing, which allows small and medium manufacturers to integrate new technologies such as the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and robotics into their production processes. This is the second major gift from, my, from Microsoft to the Connected Systems Institute. The company gave $1.5 million in 2019. So I'd like to extend my congratulations to Chancellor Mone and the entire UWM community. The University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health has been awarded $150 million in funding from the National Institutes of Health for a nationwide research initiative to investigate the neurobiology of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. The five-year grant is the largest funding award from the NIH in the history of UW-Madison. And I'd like to extend my congratulations to Chancellor Manukin and the entire Badger community. That is a great accomplishment. You know, our universities and people are doing such great things uh, and such great work every single day. I could go on and on, and sometimes that great work gets lost in some noise, um, but there is so much going on that is so great at these institutions. Those are just a few examples of what we can all be proud of. Finally, you may have seen in, uh, the article in the Chronicle of Higher Education from early January that took a deep dive look into the historic and current state of higher education here in Wisconsin. The general theme was that for too long, our state has put off hard choices with perhaps some unwelcome results. Higher education in general often gets a bad rap for being unwilling or unable to change. Certainly there's a national narrative out there that's pushing that criticism. But I would invite skeptics to look at, to take a closer look at what we're actually doing here within our own universities of Wisconsin. As I hope we're making clear by our recent actions and the strategies we're implementing for the years ahead, those strategies that were approved by this board, I believe we have a well thought out plan to ensure our universities are in a position to be vibrant and sustainable for the future, for future generations. We are committed to ensuring that we continue to serve our students, both now and going forward, while at the same time serving some of the most pressing needs of our state. We are working hard to ensure the financial viability of all of our universities. We are committed to supporting student success on multiple fronts including academic and financial support, promoting civil, civil dialogue, and ensuring our campuses are welcome and inclusive for all. We are also meeting the needs of Wisconsin and its people, and that includes individuals, families, businesses, and communities. And we will continue to fulfill our mission to pursue and grow knowledge that benefits the human condition. As I've said before, if anyone asks where we're going and where we are focusing our attention and how, we're and how we are challenging the status quo, I encourage you to tell them to take a look at our strategic plan that this board approved. We value and safeguard our legacy of excellence and our commitment to serve. We are also taking a clear-eyed look at the future and preparing our people, our universities, and our state to meet the challenges ahead whether big or small, whether known or unknown. Higher education is under fire, but the universities of Wisconsin are ready, willing, and able to adapt, grow, and build for the future. One more thing. 
we are needed. I call the region's attention to a just released report from the Wisconsin Policy Forum on the value of higher education, a copy of which was at your place when you came into the meeting this, this afternoon. Looking primarily through the lens of labor market projections, the report finds that more than half of future jobs in the state paying more than $50,000 a year will require a bachelor's degree. More significant is that more than 90% of the jobs paying more than $75,000 a year will require that degree. The data show, and I quote from the report, a continued shift in Wisconsin toward higher paying occupations that tend to require more education. At the universities of Wisconsin, we offer world-class education at the most affordable prices as compared to our Midwest peers. We are an incredible value. And we are looking to continue to invest in Wisconsin. The $32 million workforce proposal we've submitted will train engineers, nurses, computer scientists, and professional and business professionals for our state. That is just one example of what is going on at our universities. Our mission and our commitment to the state is to make it better. Uh, and that's precisely what we will be doing. President Walsh, back to you. Thank you, President Rossman. At this point in the program, I'd like to turn things over to our host, Chancellor Manukin. Thank you so much, Regent President Walsh. And good afternoon, regents, chancellors, uh, provosts, system leaders, colleagues from UW-Madison, and everyone who's here. Uh, I'm really delighted to welcome you all to UW-Madison here on uh, another unseasonably warm day. Uh, it's truly wonderful to be here with all of you. Now, as you know, this has been a year of significant challenges. And so I want to begin with a brief story of hope. A couple of months ago, I had the privilege of sitting in on a fascinating and sometimes somewhat uncomfortable discussion right here in this room. Picture 120 students from different backgrounds, different schools and majors, different places on the political spectrum, gathered in groups of 10, each with a trained faculty facilitator, eating dinner together and having a meaningful conversation about an important issue, in this case, about the flat tax. In months to come, there'll be, continue to be a range of topics, including somewhat polarizing issues like gun rights and abortion. This is a program that we're piloting this year called Deliberation Dinners designed by our Dean of our School of Education, Diana Hess. It's not meant to change minds or to help the participants reach a consensus, but it is designed to help give them skills to engage with one another productively and respectfully, even when they disagree, to engage across a difference, which needs to be a key part of the university experience. The night I sat in, there was plenty of disagreement. The students were raising hard questions about how to define fairness, what strangers owe each other or don't, and debating different ways of contributing to the greater good. At the end of the evening, I saw students who had pretty vehemently disagreed with each other walk out of the room together, chatting about how they were gonna spend their weekend or the best places to study for final exams. We're a research institution, so we will also research whether this program's working and decide whether to continue it. And I don't know whether this pilot program will turn into something bigger, but I do know we need better ways to help our students and our communities connect across their differences as we navigate the really challenging times that we're living in, where what's happening on a global, national, and state level certainly will continue to affect us. Globally, 
and just make sure this is, there we go. Globally, the brutal attack by Hamas on Israeli civilians and the ongoing devastating war in Gaza continue to have a grave and co complex impact on our faculty, staff, students, and alums. All across the country, we've seen a deeply concerning rise in both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, and we unequivocally condemn both. And here on our campus, I've heard from Jewish and Muslim students that they have felt at times unseen or unheard or judged or stereotyped based on their identities. At the same time, we've been fortunate compared to a great many others of our peer schools where these issues have caused much deeper and uglier divides. That's not to say we haven't dealt with some major challenges here too. And these have sometimes been made more complex by divisive politics nationally as well. One of the things that all of higher education will need to reckon with is the intersection between the First Amendment and Title VI, which protects students' rights to an educational experience free of severe and pervasive forms of discrimination and harassment. These important values can come into some tension with one another. And indeed, the Department of Education has opened an investigation at more than 100 campuses across the country, including ours, to find out more about how they've been handling these issues. And here in Wisconsin, we're navigating state politics in challenging times. And I want to acknowledge that this has not been easy. And I want to express my appreciation for all of you for your thoughtful approaches and engagement. I also want to be clear that diversity of all kinds is a core value for us, and we cannot and will not stop our work in this realm, full stop. At the same time, we can and should take a fresh look at what we want to accomplish and assess what we've achieved over years of investment and where there might be space or need to try something different. I believe that within the agreement we've reached with the legislature, we can stay true to the values that sustain us and we can continue to build inclusive excellence so that no matter your background, identity, experience, beliefs, or perspective, you can feel that you belong at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. This array of issues isn't easy and it won't be. These issues will challenge us and we will rise to meet these challenges in many different ways, including with programs like the deliberation dinners and in lots of other programs, experiments, and efforts. Programs built around the Wisconsin idea tradition of innovation for the public good, a tradition that's allowed us to make the world a better place for 175 years. So let me give you a brief tour of some of the spaces where we're currently excellent and some of the ways we're going to try some innovative things to bring us into a future that's even brighter than our storied past. To begin, it's been a year of excellence in education. There's sometimes a national narrative that students enroll in college, rack up a lot of debt, and then don't graduate. And that is certainly not true for us. Our four-year graduation rate rose to 75.5%, its highest ever. Our six-year graduation rate rose to just over 89%, also the highest ever, and we're in the top 10 for six-year graduation rates of public universities in the United States. As some of you might have heard this morning, our student athlete graduation rate also hit a record high this year. 93% of our student athletes graduate within six years. The average time to degree for a bachelor's degree recipient decreased to 3.84 calendar years, its shortest ever. The university conferred a record number of total, total degrees, 12,407, topping 12,000 for the first time in our history. And 65%, nearly two thirds of our undergraduates graduated with no student debt last year. 
You've heard me say before that a world-class university and our Universities of Wisconsin system needs diversity of all kinds. When people of diverse identities, experiences, backgrounds, and beliefs work together, they not only learn from one another, but they also drive creativity and innovation and come up with better solutions to problems. So I'm happy to share that the current class of freshmen and new transfer students is the most racially diverse in our history. And that freshman class includes Wisconsin students from tiny rural counties and big urban centers. In fact, 71 of the 72 Wisconsin counties are represented. This year we're missing iron, so let's we'll try to change that next year. And students from 49 of the 50 states were missing Maine and 60 countries around the world. This is the kaleidoscopic fabric that makes us great. It's also been a fantastic year for research at UW-Madison. We brought in more research dollars last year than in any year in our history. Sometimes big increases can be driven by just one remarkable grant, but that's not the case here. More than 15 departments and institutes had major increases from space science and engineering to plant pathology to the Population Health Institute. Part of this results from efforts to get a little bit more strategic, to better align ourselves with federal funding priorities. Our research related to aging is a great example. The over 65 population in the US grew faster over the past 10 years than at any time since the late 1800s. And we positioned ourselves years ago to become a leader in this arena by building big interdisciplinary research centers with the right mix of expertise to innovate across disciplines. And now, some of our biggest leaps in grant funding this year were for our longitudinal studies and our work around Alzheimer's prevention. And you might have seen the news just weeks ago of our new $150 million grant to lead a national study out of the School of Medicine and Public Health to expand understanding of the full range of problems in the brain that can cause dementia and to bring us closer to better treatments. And it is the largest NIH grant that we've ever received. We're now asking, what are other fields where we can position the university for major discovery and innovation with impact? And I'll tell you about some plans in just a couple of minutes. First, I wanna show you a few numbers. We maintained our spot as the number eight uh, largest research university in the country measured by research expenditures. But there's a bigger story here. And I'll also note that in our strategic plan, we do have the goal in the system-wide strategic plan, we have the goal of getting to, sit, to number six. In the past year, we grew faster than anyone else in the top 10 except Duke. And our five-year average growth rate is second only to Johns Hopkins. And if you look at the three institutions above us, we didn't catch up with them, but we gained on all of them. The gap between us and UCSD is now just $10 million. In 2021, we were also just behind UCSD, but we trailed them by $45 million. And we do have some strategies to power us forward that I'll tell you about shortly. I also do want to say very clearly, not all first-rate research is grant-funded research. We have many ways that we engage and do important work at our institution. And so we need to remember that while this is one important frame for a good portion of what we do in the research space, it does not capture the whole. And it's very important for us all to remember that as well. I'll say just a brief word about our state's new designation as a regional technology and innovation hub for biohealth and personalized medicine, which President Rothman also mentioned, and which you'll hear about also at tomorrow's morning's panel discussion. 
This was fundamentally an opportunity for partnership, for partnerships across the state to work together in a next level way. And it paid off. There were 400 regions across the country competing for this designation and only 31 were selected. And so I am great, very grateful for that partnership in so many ways, including with the whole system and many, many other partners. But I also do need to say that our powerhouse research enterprise played a crucial role in tipping the scales. It is difficult to imagine that we would have gotten the designation without it. We're now competing for significant funding that will go to probably fewer than 10 of the 31 hubs. And we should know more by summer, so stay tuned. Now, one necessary ingredient for bringing in major grants and growing our research is a modern physical infrastructure. And this year we made some good progress on some key facilities. Babcock Hall and our Center for Dairy Research, our doctors on call to Wisconsin's dairy industry, had not been updated in any significant way since back when Harry Truman was president. As of last spring, we now we have the largest state-of-the-art dairy facility in the nation, and it's already transforming innovation in research and education and our work with partners from one of the state's most important industries. The long-awaited expansion of the School of Veterinary Medicine is close to completion. The first two floors, housing surgery, critical care, imaging, and a number of labs will be opening this spring, and that will enhance significantly our ability to provide care for animals large and small. And it's been so exciting to see the School of Computer Data and Information Sciences take shape. It's really coming together, not quite as fast as in this video, uh, and it will be the anchor for our high-tech corridor that's going to link computing to biomedical research, to engineering, to medicine. It will bring together partners from all over campus and beyond to ignite discovery and innovation to help power Wisconsin's growing tech sector. And just as importantly, it will be the campus home for our largest major, computer science, and our fastest growing major, data science, and a place that welcomes all students from all majors to expand their learning in these critical areas. The ability to synthesize, analyze, and translate large complex sets of data spans nearly all the disciplines in our campus. And of course, we know that AI is growing increasingly important too, and more on that in just a minute. With the help of the regents, the legislature, Governor Evers, and what I think is the biggest, broadest coalition of business and industry partners that we've ever assembled, at this point, I am hopeful that we are finally on our way to replacing an engineering facility that was last renovated nearly 40 years ago. As you know, this facility was the UW system's number one priority and will be jointly funded by us and the state. We already have donor uh, strong interest in funding 110 million of the 150 million that we're committed to raising. And our already energetic fundraising team has now kicked into even higher gear. This building will allow us to create a total of about a thousand new spaces for undergraduates in engineering at a time when, with, with, when Wisconsin employers desperately need more engineers. And while we have terrific engineering programs throughout the universities of Wisconsin system, we are also sending too many Wisconsin students to places like Illinois and Purdue. This building will also enhance our ability to support top scholars from around the world to come and be part of what we are doing here to drive the kinds of discoveries and innovations that will allow us to take on grand challenges and it will expand our ability to work with industry partners. We have some exciting things taking place with partners from industry all over campus. In November, for example, we announced a 10-year collaboration between our School of Medicine and Public Health and GE Healthcare. And that's what you're seeing in that picture. I wanna thank the regents for approving this agreement. 
It builds on work we've been doing together for the last decade with a new focus on developing the next frontier of technologies for diagnosing and treating diseases like cancer in ever more personalized and precise ways. Our long partnership with GE Healthcare has now fueled more than 130 research projects. It's a great example of the ways in which industry investment that aligns with our mission can drive discovery and help us change and improve lives. So further building these partnerships is a substantial priority. Now you saw that we're number eight in overall research expenditures but we're number 46 in industry investment in R&D. Now that's up from number 52 last year, and perhaps 46 is a little more impressive when you know that it's out of 900 institutions, but still we can do better. And I think we are on the right track. If you look at growth in dollars alone, $8.9 million, our increase puts us in seventh place among the top 10 for growth last year. But if you look at percentage terms, we grew by 28%, faster than any other school in the top 10. And this isn't just a one great year story. We have outpaced some of our competitors in the top 10 since 2018. It's important to note that our industry engagements go well beyond research and well beyond Wisconsin's major employers. University expertise is helping to build thriving businesses and vibrant downtowns all over the state. And that is part of the Wisconsin idea. And certainly one of our greatest statewide ambassadors is the division of extension. I spent half a day with a group of extension employees in November and learned about the incredible range of work they're doing in all of Wisconsin's 72 counties. And I've also had a chance to visit with extension in a variety of places across the state. To give you just a couple of examples, they recently held facil facilitated conversations in 32 counties across the state to bring people from different sides of the political spectrum together to talk about hot button, button issues. Interestingly, Afterwards, participants reported viewing one another as less hypocritical and less selfish than had been their previous stereotype. They're also nourishing entrepreneurship in rural areas, as well as our cities, to create the kinds of opportunities that help people and communities to flourish. Now, these are just two of the huge number of projects that they do, and they're having significant impact. But they're sometimes so woven into the fabric of the state that people don't realize that extension is UW-Madison or even the universities of Wisconsin more broadly. And so I am challenging our extension leadership and employees to do an even better job of sharing the impact of their work and to sharing that they're part of us. So we have a lot to be proud of, I think, and I hope you'll agree. But my job, our job, is to make this institution even a step stronger by building on our existing excellence and also by thinking in big, bold ways about where we can take a quantum leap forward to serve this state and the world. And so let me tell you about a few of the things in store this year. First, we're putting together an outstanding new class. We just received final numbers for applicants for the next freshman year, and we have continued our 15-year record-setting streak. Nearly 66,000 applicants applied, 66,000 students applied for a spot in our freshman class, an increase of about 3.7% over last year. Students and families are continuing to recognize that exciting things are happening here at UW-Madison. We also have two initiatives we've launched and about which you've heard, but I'm still gonna say a little bit here, to improve access and remove barriers for talented Wisconsin students, especially with high financial need. A year ago in this space, I announced one of those programs, Bucky's Pell Pathway, for Wisconsin students who qualify for the federal Pell Grant. It's a last dollar in scholarship that sits on top 
of Pell Grants and other scholarships the students might be receiving, and it covers the full cost of attendance. Yes, tuition, but also expected costs for room and board, fees, books, living expenses. For talented students from Wisconsin families who have the greatest need to come here to UW-Madison. I'm delighted to tell you that in its first year, Bucky's Pell Pathway is serving 977 students from 65 Wisconsin counties. And our Bucky's Pell Pathway students are outstanding. Let me introduce you to just one of them. This is Maddie Place. She's a freshman from Platteville who plans to major in business. She was class president for all four years of high school. She played the flute and band, and she participated in numerous student clubs, all while earning outstanding grades in a rigorous curriculum. In other words, she's exactly the kind of student who belongs at our state's flagship. But her family's finances haven't always been stable. So when she got word that she qualified for Bucky's Pell Pathway, she told us she was completely shocked. She relayed the excitement of sharing the news with her mom and the relief she felt knowing she could come here and just focus on being a student without constant worry about bills or a substantial debt load. That's the impact of this great program. I also wanna mention the new Wisconsin Tribal Educational Promise Program. This is a program that we designed in partnership with tribal leaders. And you might have seen coverage when we announced it in December. It will cover the full cost of a UW-Madison undergraduate degree for state residents who are members of federally recognized Indian tribes in Wisconsin. And it will apply starting this fall for incoming students and current students. We've also begun a five-year pilot to cover in-state tuition and fees for enrolled members of tribes in Wisconsin to pursue JD degrees and MD degrees, law degrees and medical school degrees, given the pressing need for these professions in the native communities. And I wanna thank the tribal leaders who worked in partnership with us to design this program. One important note, both Bucky's Pell Pathway and the Wisconsin Educational Tribal Promise Program are funded fully by the university without any state tax dollars contributing. Now looking forward, how do we innovate for the public good in education even more than we are right now? Now building educational excellence takes more than recruiting outstanding students and helping them graduate on time. It also takes outstanding classroom experiences. Many of you heard this morning how we're using AI in education and how many of our students have transformative experiences in research. And I'm so glad those of you who were here for part of the education session got to hear from our truly exceptional students. I love though also that our instructors are often also looking for small things that can make a meaningful difference to improve learning. And it's an important lesson that while we do want big and bold initiatives, Little things matter too. This is Brianna Burton, and she's a faculty member here. And that climbing wall picture is something she shows her students at the start of the semester to explain her role as an educator, that it will provide support for students as they navigate their way to the top. One of the classes she teaches is about 60 students from a wide variety of majors. And it covers, among other topics, how different kinds of bacteria organize their DNA. The process she's teaching, she, she teaches is so new that there weren't any great textbook images for her to use. She was using what you can see on the left, pulled from a research article. And that required students to try to visualize a three-dimensional process that was brand new to them. And many of them found that tough to do. And so she started using this instead. The media team at the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Mentoring worked with her to bring the image to life and to make it into a 3D animation that could make more sense. She compared test results from two different classes before and after, 
and found that with the hard copy 2D images, 57% demonstrated that they understood that concept. And it went up to 80% with the animation. We often talk about the bigger, splashier changes we're making in education, but these small hinges can open big doors and we try to create infrastructure to support our faculty in being able to tweak their classes to make them better too. Moving on to research. Maintaining and advancing discovery on this campus is going to require us to work collectively and strategically to build strength for the future. And so in my remaining time with you, I'm pleased to share with you three ways that we're doing just that. One is about nourishing and advancing entrepreneurship to help bring more UW-Madison research and innovations out of our labs and classrooms and out of the great ideas of those in our community and into the world. A second is to greatly expand our work in and our commitment to sustainability, which includes creating a new sustainability research hub. And then a new initiative to catalyze our excellence to address some of the world's grand challenges. First, entrepreneurship. This is still in its early stages, but my goal is to help take our already thriving hubs of innovation and entrepreneurial excellence and make it even stronger. And I've, I've appointed this mighty all-star team to take a close look at how we can do what we're already doing even better. How can we knit together the many programs that already exist? Which of them are working best? Which might need tweaking around our campus? How can we make them easier to tap into and even more successful? And where do we have the opportunity, both ourselves and in partnership, to try some new and different things to support the great many faculty, staff, and students who are interested in entrepreneurship and commercialization. There's more than 400 companies all over Wisconsin that have their origin stories here at UW-Madison. And they range from industry leaders like Epic or Shine to small startups, some of which are growing, founded by our students like Fetch Rewards and Eat Streets, and so many more, including more than 25 companies founded by faculty and students in our Department of Medical Physics. Our UW, entrepreneur, our UW Madison entrepreneurs are changing lives and communities. They're creating jobs and they're contributing hundreds of millions of dollars to the state's economy. At the same time, our students are pursuing entrepreneurship education like never before. We've had a 700% growth in enrollment in classes in these areas over the last 15 years. And this state has emerged as a national powerhouse in high growth areas like the life sciences, thanks to the entrepreneurial ecosystems we've built here. And so it's clear this is an area where we've been doing some pretty great things, but where there are also likely further opportunities to magnify our economic impact on Wisconsin, to shepherd life-changing innovations out into the world and to strengthen this state's economy broadly. This working group is engaging broadly in conversations within and well outside our institution and will bring me some recommendations later this spring, so stay tuned. Next, I'm really excited to announce that we're launching a major cross-campus initiative around environmental sustainability, focused on advancing not only our research, but also education and making UW-Madison a living laboratory for sustainable practices. This is a place where we've been pioneers in many ways, from ecology and wildlife biology, to land restoration, to the use of satellite technology to detect changes in the environment. We have an impressive list of past accomplishments, but these alone don't qualify us to be a world leader in sustainability. What I think does qualify us to lead is the particular way in which we often engage with the work, which is quite simply to start with looking at real world concrete problems, leaning into the pragmatism that is so naturally UW. Many of our accomplishments in this space have begun not in a university lab, but in the community, 
wading into trout streams with people who fish, walking the North Woods with hunters, visiting dairy farms, talking with urban farmers in Milwaukee. The very essence of the Wisconsin idea. The community engagement drives and shapes cutting edge environmental research and scholarship. This is what we owe to our neighbors and to Wisconsin as settlers on native land, as beneficiaries of public funds, and as educators preparing our students to make a real difference in the world. And so I'm very excited to announce this initiative. And I really wanna thank the Nelson Institute and the Office of Sustainability, along with our ASM Student Advisory Council on Sustainability, all of which, all of whom have played significant roles in helping us to be able to announce this today. And I think we may have some of our students from ASM in the room. Do we? Raise your hands. Yes, let's give them a round of applause. I really appreciate the way that they've helped lead in this space and also their creativity and the further work they're going to do um, with respect to these important questions. So I'm really excited to announce this initiative. And you can see the goals on this next slide. They're also in the handouts that you should have. I won't take the time to go through all of them, but a few comments on a couple of our goals. First, addressing the environmental impact on our of our campus, which is both imperative and an outstanding opportunity to do some innovative things. And so we're setting for the first time some clear and defined campus-wide targets in this space. And that's essential on a campus the size of a city where we'll only succeed if we define what success looks like and work together. Like our environmental research, this initiative will be very community focused because what happens on our campus affects our neighbors. As just one example, when, when we moved from coal power to gas power, Dane County's air quality improved. Our students are brimming with ideas for making our campus a living laboratory. And in fact, some of you may have seen the demo outside earlier today, where some of our students are developing ways to try to grow plants while also creating solar energy. And I know they're going to inspire a number of future initiatives, as well as ones that we've already begun. And I'm also very excited to see how we're able to weave this work more intentionally into our curriculum, something we already do, but I think we can do more of. I also want to make mention of the Sustainability Research Hub. This will be a center of excellence intentionally designed to build on our long tradition of working across. At many universities, such hubs are often embedded in one school or one college, and that's not how we're doing it here. To jumpstart it, I'm fully funding it initially out of my office, locating it in our Nelson Institute, and they're working to ensure that every researcher in every discipline on campus can make use of it if they wish to, so that they'll have the resources and the opportunity to pursue sustainability research if they want to. And we can do still more to break down barriers and tear down silence. The final project I'm gonna to talk to you about today is our Quantum Leap, and I'm thrilled to be announcing it. I wanna introduce you to the Wisconsin RISE Initiative, where RISE stands for Research, Innovation, and Scholarly Excellence. We're going to look at the grand challenges facing our state and the world, and work to grow our faculty in a targeted way that builds on our existing strengths in places where with strategy and investment, we can accelerate discovery and world-changing research, where we can improve education and innovate for the public good and be absolutely best in class. Because here at UW-Madison, we want to rise to meet the biggest research challenges of our time. Over the last months, Provost Isbell and I have been in discussions with the deans and they've been in discussions with their faculty and others to arrive at three key goals. First, 
to recruit top scholars from multiple disciplines at all stages of their careers, to bring interdisciplinary perspectives to many facets of deeply complex and important areas and problems. Second, to focus in meaningful part on areas with the potential to attract significant extramural research funding, as well as philanthropy, to further drive discovery and get us closer to any number of moonshots. And third, to create exciting educational opportunities for our students at all levels. Now, as this initiative progresses, there will be several FOSA. Each will be interdisciplinary and each will involve a number of our schools and colleges. And I'm pleased to tell you that in addition to announcing the initiative, I'm delighted that, to announce the first RISE focus area, which will be artificial intelligence. You heard about that, those of you who participated in education, you heard about its importance earlier today. This capitalizes on our strengths in data science and computer science, and also pulls in social sciences, human ecology, the humanities, to put people at the center of our solutions so that we can work to make sure that AI works for all of us. AI and machine learning are already enhancing human abilities in every one of our disciplines and offering extraordinarily powerful tools that allow us to sift through huge quantities of data to find patterns and trends that guide decision-making and help solve problems. And our past discoveries and innovations in related areas are a launch pad, I think, to a dazzling future. To give just one example, Professor Myron Professor Miron Livni uh, pioneered high throughput computing techniques that are now powering some of the world's largest scientific experiments, including the search for cosmic neutrinos and black holes. An example about, of how new techniques can create new opportunities. Today, that work is part of what positions us to move forward in exciting new directions. And again, to give just one example, uh, Juan Casado, is an investigator at the Morgridge Institute who's now applying Professor Livney's techniques to biological imaging, which could turbocharge our understanding of cell biology and help us discover new drugs. And this is just one area. Our faculty, staff, and students are already using AI in all kinds of exciting ways. To give just a couple of examples, the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences is using it to help farmers predict yield, crop yields and detect disease before it spreads. The Center for Healthy Minds is exploring how to develop personalized micro supports delivered through our mobile devices. For example, to engage a student in a breathing exercise just before an exam. And just last week, one of our undergraduate entrepreneur students who's built his own small consulting gig around the ethical use of AI, led a workshop for faculty and staff in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication entitled AI as Your Teaching Co-Pilot. There are tremendous possibilities and tremendous concerns. AI needs expert human guidance and ethical guardrails. And we are also on the leading edge of scholarship that can help ensure the ethical, responsible, and trustworthy use of AI. And so there's genuinely transformative potential with high stakes, great possibilities, and significant risks. And we already have a good number of talented faculty in a variety of relevant disciplines working in this space. And so we have a very strong foundation on which to build. And so AI was in some ways, perhaps just a natural choice to be the first focus area for our Wisconsin RISE initiative. We'll begin hiring soon. It's late in this season, but we'll begin a little bit even this spring and continue in phases with the ultimate goal of through this initiative, hiring up to 50 more new faculty into this initiative than we would have been likely to do without this project. We are fortunate that our growth in enrollment and our growth in research gives us this kind of opportunity to grow our faculty and the necessity to do so. Wisconsin RISE will open up not just research opportunities, but also exciting pathways in education at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. 
It's simply a fact that every student in every major is going to need at least some familiarity and facility with AI. And investing in this way will give us, I think, a virtuous circle, a virtuous cycle, where the university will be positioned to compete for research funding, both federal and private, on a new level, which will invest in the ability to do more discovery and innovation, which in turn attracts great faculty, which in turn attracts great students and lets us do even more in the classroom as well. The AI initiative is our first RISE initiative, but it will be the first of several. We are also rolling out a process that will continue to invite our faculty, staff, and campus leaders to work across disciplines to advance further bold ideas that can change the world. The deans are helping to spearhead the process to bring the strongest of those ideas to the provost and me for consideration for the next several RISE initiatives. As you can probably tell, I'm very excited to see how Wisconsin Rise will help ignite creativity even further and enhance our ability to take on the most pressing challenges of our time. And I really wanna thank our provost and all of the deans and the considerable number of faculty who have already been deeply involved in thinking this through and putting it together. So let me conclude with this. As I hope you can tell, I'm pretty bullish on this amazing university, and I hope that you are too. This is an incredible institution, and even in challenging times, there is an extraordinary amount to be proud of. We are proud of what we are accomplishing here at UW-Madison, and we are proud to be part of the universities of Wisconsin, all of which are committed to providing transformative opportunities to students all over our great state. We are meeting the moment in many ways as we have for 175 years and doing so with integrity and discipline and a spirit of cooperation. And that is thanks to the incredible community of partners that are part of what we're doing, including our phenomenally talented faculty, staff, and students, the most loyal and dedicated alums and donors anywhere, our collaborators across industry and communities, and certainly our partners at the other universities of Wisconsin campuses and in the UW administration. And all of you, members of the Board of Regents who provide the leadership and oversight to support and guide our work. These are the ingredients for a dazzling future, and I am looking forward to building that together with all of you. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions if you wish. Thank you all. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Chancellor Manukin. Questions or comments from Regents? I, I think it's safe to say that seeing the increase in, in the amount of business and industry-related research is really gratifying, and I'm excited to hear that you're moving forward with making that a priority. It's so important. Thank you. We absolutely are. And of course, that intersects with the entrepreneurship activities that we're doing as well. What do you think is going to make the difference to get us there? Because it's been sitting low for some time. I think it's going to be a number of small to medium-sized things. I don't think it's a single uh I don't think it's one thing that we can just kind of launch and transform. And I think we're already beginning some of those. And those range from rethinking a little bit how we how we structure IP. We've got a new initiative there where we're making some of our IP arrangements just a little bit clearer and cleaner um, to make those conversations easier, to streamline those engagements. I think we're uh, we've been over the last several years uh, growing our efforts in our Office of Business Engagement. And I think they've been doing really terrific work. And some of what you're seeing here is paying that off, paying off. I also think that there is a little bit of culture change where 
More folks on campus engaged in research recognize the power of industry partnerships. We've always had a number of faculty very interested in that, but that's growing. We've also been doing some pretty incredible work in the clinical trial space um, to be growing our engagement there, which is often in partnership with industry. So I think there's, um, I think it's a laddering process where um, it's moving up rung by rung and suddenly you can find that you're in a very different place than where you were. Right, and there's there's no shortage of problems or expertise, but I'm wondering, you know, are, are you targeting the administrative reasons why we're not where we should be? Is that fair to say? Is the... The administrative challenges with increasing those numbers. We've got expertise. We've certainly got problems from industry. You know, we're not always, we are big and decentralized and folks don't necessarily know exactly where to go or where we might be able to engage in help. And so we're working too on making that a little bit clearer and more streamlined. We've also been, um, I mean, this isn't brand new. I don't want to suggest we weren't doing this before, but we're bringing key partners to campus uh, our researchers, folks from OBE, I, we're all going out and visiting industry partners and um, trying to strengthen and thicken some of those, those partnerships. So I think it's multifaceted, but we are beginning to see it bearing fruit and that's exciting. Great. Other comments or questions? Yes, Regent Weatherly. Oh, I mean, it's incredible that we have 60,000 plus applications. Um, unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to accept all of those uh, students and there's very many qualified students that frankly we want to make sure that they're wisconsinites not only when they're freshmen but when they're 30 year olds 40 year olds 50 year olds we've increasingly seen the rates of madison not at its not attending other uw schools do you have any thoughts about how we can work better between madison as a system to make sure that we're retaining as many of the students, not only those that can go to Madison, but those that you don't have before that we're keeping up in the state and in the system? Yes, I think, I mean, your, your question has a number of different parts to it, uh, Regent Motherly, and I appreciate, uh, I appreciate all of them. I, I think that there's a few different aspects to this. I mean, one thing to just make mention of is that although I don't have the data right in front of me, um, we are seeing, meaningful, modest but meaningful increases in the percentage of Madison students that are taking first positions here in this state. Um, and we've seen pretty significant increases uh, for Wisconsin residents. We've also seen increases in our out-of-state students who take their first position after college uh, here in the state of Wisconsin. And so that's exciting to see. So that was one part of your question. The other part of your question, how can we help ensure the success of our sister campuses? How can we try to help direct students who may not have the opportunity to come to Madison uh, to go to one of our sister campuses instead of leaving? And I don't think there's a simple answer to that. We want to be good partners there and we are open to engaging in finding, uh, finding paths forward. I do think there are some students where I've got to be honest, they're looking at flagships at these other states. And if, if they don't come to us, they're going to go to Minnesota or Illinois or, or you know, UCLA, you know, like to, to one of these other flagships across, across the country. And I'm not sure that no matter how transformative and excellent some of our other schools are, that it will be realistic for that group to try to change their thinking. I certainly don't think there's very much I can do from my position for that. I think there's another very substantial group of students who are applying to other system campuses. And I mean, and also some students were very large. Some students choose another campus instead of us, even when they do get into Madison, right? So we are not right for everybody. And so trying to go deeper in looking at that is certainly something we can work on. I've also had really productive conversations with several of, uh, of my fellow chancellors about thinking about transfer pathways and ways that we can maybe lift up existing programs and give them a little bit more visibility and attention because um, we actually have 
a transfer pathways program that I think isn't very well known or well understood. And so we could uh, look at drawing more attention to that. And frankly, some students who might decide to, to go to one of our, our, our sister institutions thinking that they'll transfer to Madison, maybe after, after a year or two, they'll want to do that, but maybe they'll be having a fabulous experience and will decide to stay right where they are. So these are some of the things we can look at. But I also, I do think we have to be, um, we, I, I can't look at you and say that I think that there's going to be an easy way to get students who don't have the opportunity for Madison and are currently ending up at Minnesota where they can go for an in-state rate um, to necessarily make a different choice. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes, Regent Underly. Thank you so much, Regent President. Um, Chancellor Manuk, and this was wonderful. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it certainly underscores the importance of the intersection between industry and commerce and education, um, technology and the Wisconsin idea. And so it just really appreciated that, you know, just underscoring the point further that our, our success as a state and our success for our kids' future rides on that continued investment in education. So thank you for doing that. And I just wanted you to know, it just gave me so much more to think about and certainly also many things to be proud about. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Regent Many Deeds. Thank you, President. Chancellor, I'd like to thank you and the uh, your team, the University of Wisconsin Madison, for, for giving people that only had a dream of coming here you know, hope that they can come here by way of implementing the, the Bucky's Top pathway and the travel. Uh, educational promise. I think those are great things for those individuals that now can maybe realize that. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I very, I really appreciate that. And certainly access and opportunity, especially for Wisconsinites, needs to be part of what we do and what we offer as, especially as a function. So thank you for that. Regent okay. Regents. Any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none, thank you very much again, Chancellor Manukin. We're going to take a 10 minute break. Please return in 10 minutes for the next item. Let's uh, come back together after our short break here. Uh, we have one more item, which is uh, another update on our strategic plan, and I, I hope we've mentioned this enough times that you, you all, all y'all are getting the idea that we're very serious about this, and we are. So this is another in a series of regular progress reports on implementing that strategic plan. I would now like to invite Dr. Monica Smith, Associate Vice President for Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, to present an update on her recent efforts and priorities moving forward. Dr. Smith. Good afternoon. Thank you, Regent Walsh. I don't know if you, is your mic close enough to you? You might wanna bring it right up to your, yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Regent Walsh. And good afternoon, everyone. Glad to be here today to talk a little bit about my role at the system, highlight some of what I've done since I've been here, share the scope and influence of equity, diversity, uh, and inclusion in higher education, and connect this work with the strategic plan update. My role at the system is to be a resource for system administration and our campuses, and to support and par partner with offices across all elements of the strategic plan. In higher education, equity, diversity, and inclusion is not meant to be additive nor siloed. Instead, best practices and guidance for equity, diversity, and inclusion is that it is embedded and infused in higher education practices and institutional functioning. All of our strategic plan goals focus on student success directly or indirectly, and the work of equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging in higher education does the same. That being said, EDIB is infused throughout our strategic plan, and it requires cross-functional collaborations 
with within the within the UW system administration that ought to be an exemplar to all of our UW institutions. I want you to know that I have visited most of the universities. I've met with senior leadership, student facing staff, the EDI teams. I have reviewed and discussed strategic plans, recognizing connections between campus plans and the system board approved strategic plan. I've also under, I'm also beginning to have an understanding of the associate, associated progress and the challenges in meeting our strategic goals. I met with students to learn about their experiences and their aspirations. And I had the opportunity to visit some of the catalytic spaces on campus that our students frequent. This slide identifies the three strategic areas that I will talk about. Strategic area one of the plan, in my opinion, is primary. All other strategies feed into strategy one to increase access and improve rates of success for historically underserved students so that there is parity with those students who are not underserved. While diversity, equity, and inclusion benefits all students, historically, underserved students are mentioned in this strategy. This is an important distinction, largely because these populations of students tend to have multiple at-risk characteristics that can hinder their success. It is important to note the language in Strategic One to increase access and improve rates of success. I highlight rates of success, which speaks to benchmarks and measurements. It will be important to identify milestones toward degree completion. And what I mean by that is recognizing progress and the areas or the points where there seem to be lags or snags, those things that disrupt the process for our students. Attention to the markers along the academic journey can help us to know where particular barriers lie and where to target our interventions. The remainder of my update will focus on strategy two and strategy two, strategy three. So strategy two, champion student success across the higher education life cycle. When we talk about student success, we understand that to be from the point of application to graduation and post-graduation. Identifying barriers to persistence and to ensure equitable access to necessary resources to promote sex across to promote success across the learning environment is extremely important. I need a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you see that I put student success and cultural competencies under strategy too. With respect to cultural competency, competencies, this is both developing and enhancing knowledge and skill sets that are necessary for effective and impactful engagement on campus, in our classrooms, the residence halls, gathering spaces, et cetera, but also internships and externships and study away and more. For post-graduation, cultural fluency and cultural competencies specific to career readiness and the work environment are essential. Our students, spend four years at our institutions. And we need to make sure that when they have degree in hand, they are also having the skills to be career ready so that they can receive, uh, so they, they can be competitive in the job market. The National Association of Colleges and Employee, Employers embeds DEI and the competencies for a career ready workforce in its, um, in its overall discussion of what is necessary. Equity and inclusion is one of the eight standalone competencies for a career ready workforce. So again, for equity and inclusion to be embedded in our institutions practice in our learning environments is essential for career readiness. Strategy three, to promote excellence in teaching, prioritize recruitment development, retention of high quality diverse faculty and staff. We have to recognize that DEI, two elements of DEI is content and process. 
cross-functional collaborations are important. Diversity professionals are strategic partners in higher education. We partner with faculty, we partner with staff, again, from application through graduation and post-graduation. I'll say more about strategy one and strategy two a little later. I do want to talk about really quickly this graphic. This graphic is a three-dimensional model for diversity in higher education, and it is borrowed from the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education. It is an overview of the foci of EDI in higher ed. My training as a diversity officer is through this particular organization. It is specific to diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher education. There are standards for professional practice, 18 standards for professional practice. There is uh, evidence-based theory that we use and we turn that theory into praxis on our campuses. You will see in the top portion of the, of the cube, social identity characteristics. And just in case they're not easy to read, I will read them off. Race and ethnicity, gender, age, sexual orientation, disability, religion, national and geographic origin, language use, socioeconomic status, first generation, veteran, military status, political ideology, and neurodiversity ought to also be included there. So when we talk about the social identity characteristics, no student is left out, no person is left out. We also recognize, or our approach is also an intersectional approach to identify and recognize that focusing on the whole student requires us to recognize the multiple dimensions of a student, the identities that they are born with, the ones they grow into, and, as, and their social experiences. The second one that I'll talk about is core areas, and I'll just do a, trait, uh, a, a reading of that list, recruitment and retention, campus climate, curriculum and instruction, research and inquiry, intergroup relations and discourse, student, faculty and staff, achievement and success. So we're talking about professional development there also. Leadership development, non-discrimination, procurement and supplier diversity. Supplier diversity includes types of industries. It means large businesses and small businesses. So our Institute for Business um, and Entrepreneurship, I'll just say is one of, the, uh, one of the areas that I'm partnering with. Institutional advancement, external relations, strategic planning and accountability. And then to the right, focal groups, faculty, staff, administrators, trustees, alumni, and others. And so all of this are multiple points of engagement and there's a broad reach and a broad scope for diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher education. This inclusive excellence framework is the approach that I use and we use at the system for diversity, equity, and inclusion across our campuses. When we talk about inclusive excellence, we're talking about the recognition that an institution's success is dependent on how well it values, engages, and includes the rich diversity of students, staff, faculty, administrators, alumni, and more. Education needs to work for all. Expanding access to quality education is key to making opportunity real. Access and equity or equitable practices are essential to student success and post-graduation endeavors. They, there are entrenched practices on, in higher education that tend to reinforce inequities that lead to vastly different outcomes for some of our students, particularly for low-income first-generation and for students of color. For example, when a student has three of these characteristics, Traditional practices in higher education normally focus on one of those dimensions. Diversity, equity, and inclusion requires, again, that we see the whole student and we are partnering with them across their career in higher education. 
to not address any one of the identity characteristics or experiences will result in us failing the very students who, we, who, who will become our future leaders and citizens. So the inclusive excellence framework is a framework for thinking about equity, diversity and belonging and student success in higher education and how colleges can tackle the challenges that exist with an increasingly diverse student body. The graphic links together all aspects of the student experience to strengthen the academic experience, the student's social life, well-being, and career readiness. It is a relevant framework to reach all students and engage them through multiple touch points throughout their academic career at our UW institutions. This framework is a model for improving academic outcomes, particularly for underserved students. And that makes sense because these are the groups of students who we continue to recognize haven't reached academic parity with those who do not have similar identity and experiential similarities. This model touches every part of a college campus also, including the diversity of faculty and staff members and partnerships with the surrounding community. Very quickly, as you look at this image, these are linkages of areas throughout the institution. And I'll quickly talk about how we should consider student success, including career readiness and what is necessary and how the university may need to transform or shift some of its practices again to meet the needs of our students. Access and success. This dimension refers to the compositional diversity among the constituent groups, again, faculty, staff, students, alumni, community partners in their context specific outcomes or benefits that are gained from their relationships. And so processes like recruitment, retention, development, and long-term uh, outcomes are, are key focuses of this particular dimension. We have to think about um, the students' uh, experiences across education and how the institution's uh, purpose and opportunities to those students might need to shift a bit again to meet the needs of students. Higher education has to remain relevant if we're going to continue to recruit students and be able to prepare students to be work ready. And this relevance means understanding the students as they come to us and being able to meet them where they are and support them across their four years at the institution. We also have to be aware of students' expectations for higher education, which includes, among other things, a diverse campus, and focusing on issues like social justice, which includes environmental justice, issues with equity, inclusion, pay equity, um, what's happening around the globe. Many, many things that I think um, were not a part of uh, the thrust of higher education, perhaps when some of us were um, earning our undergraduate degrees. Secondly, climate and intergroup relationships. A better way of saying this is sense of belonging and the student experience. This really is what it feels like for individuals to be on our campuses and the behavioral experiences and norms that are present. Effective and innovative cultures depend on individuals feeling comfortable to take interpersonal risks and to bring their whole selves to the learning environment and to the work environment. So then there's an expectation that the university and local community are working together to build a living, learning, and working environment where all individuals are supported, where all individuals are respected, where they feel a similar sense of belonging, and they are thriving. Measuring constituent perceptions related to feeling respected, belonging, and a prevalence of affirming relationships with peers and administration are among the concepts that are present in this dimension. The climate surveys that we've had in the past and will have in the future help us to understand the experiences of our students and to make improvements where necessary. Education and scholarship. This relates to the ways in which curriculum, teaching, research, scholarship, and employee and student development contribute to their own learning, to their own development, as well as their passion for discovery and innovation and community engagement. 
service and social justice. Programs and processes in this dimension include intentionality designed around the curricula and pedagogies, as well as targeted professional development activities that promote intercultural awareness and competence. We must consider what opportunities students have to participate and contribute across, their, uh, across the campus. Infrastructure and investment. Think of this as policies and resources, organizational communication structures, performance measures that inform and enable an intentionally inclusive, equitable environment, as well as innovation. So where do we invest our energies and where do we invest our funds? And then finally, community and partnership. Institutions are place-based organizations. And so considering what a reciprocal engagement looks like in the communities where our institutions are placed, how are our institutions engaged in a participatory way with surrounding neighborhoods, counties, and across the state? So we have to be um, good neighbors and we have to understand and track our impacts in terms of the financial and social well-being of the communities and partners with which we are engaged. And so again, the inclusive excellence framework not only takes into account the student experience across their academic career, but also it considers the institution as a living organism, if you will, um, making the changes that are necessary for students, but also being active in the community. Also, our institutions are microcosms of society. What happens in the larger society and who is in the larger society are also at our, in our institutions. And if we expect for our students to be on our campuses for four years uh, or more, then we should be institutions that allow them to thrive, that challenge them in many ways, that help them to develop critical thinking, uh, and to support their uh, their academic journeys and their career aspirations. Strategy two, champion student success across the higher education life cycle. And I'll just focus on strategy 2.3, enhancing focus on achieving a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment for our students. I said earlier that we look at student success from application through graduation and post-graduation and that it is necessary to identify and navigate barriers to persistence to increase opportunities for learning and engagement. We recognize that the entire campus is the learning environment. And so in terms of my role at the system and with our institutions, you see three bullet points there that I will partner with campuses to infuse strategies for developing and enhancing cultural competencies in curricular, co-curricular, and extracurricular programs. These are multiple touch points for students to experience inclusive inclusivity. Secondly, partnering with the Office of Professional and Instructional Development um, and to ensure that our essential learning outcomes, which define the knowledge and skills that are gained from a liberal arts education exist for the students and providing a framework to guide the students' cumulative progress. And so partnering with OPID and our teaching and learning centers to enhance instruction aligned with the essential learning outcomes and career readiness. And then finally, working with campuses to increase student participation in multiple high impact practices, including career development opportunities. Teaching and learning practices um, that are designated as high impact practices are based on evidence of significant educational benefits for students who participate in them, including and especially those students from demographic groups that have been historically underserved by higher education. These practices take many different forms depending on learner characteristics and on institutional priorities. There are 11 high, high impact practices, capstone courses and projects, collaborative assignments and projects, common intellectual experiences, diversity and global awareness, e-portfolios, first year seminars and experiences, internships, service learning, community-based learning, 
undergraduate research and writing and intensive writing uh, intensive courses. And so when we think about where diversity and global awareness fits in this, we're talking about intercultural knowledge and that and intercultural skills. We're talking about engagement that impacts their decision making and their own personal growth. We know that when students are affirmed or exposed to diversity and global awareness, they leave those spaces and they leave our campuses empowered. Strategy three, promote excellence in teaching and prioritize recruitment, development and retention of high quality, diverse faculty and staff. And I'll just focus on strategy 3.1, advancing an inclusive and engaging campus environment. The first two bullet points, partnering with system offices to build a foundation for system-wide principles of inclusivity and dialogue. And secondly, increasing opportunities for critical, critical dialogue to discuss current events and issues that are affecting our national, global, and local communities. I have developed partnerships with the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, as well as the Wisconsin Institute for Citizenship and Dialogue with Madison Hillel Foundation and considering exploring opportunities with PEN America. Um, and these, the three of these, uh, four of these entities separately focus on um, civil dialogue, focus on issues of citizenship and tackle uh, challenging issues that uh, are part of our local communities as well as the global landscape. PEN America focuses specifically on freedom of expression, academic freedom, inclusion, worldviews, and developing and increasing enhancing knowledge and skills to navigate spaces. And again, to think critically about current issues and important topics. I've already talked about um, bullet point three that carries across strategies two and three. And finally, on this slide, conduct system-wide campus climate surveys. I mentioned this a little earlier. Our campus climate surveys are really key to help us to have our thumb on the pulse of our campus environment. It helps us to understand our student experience. And so be to be able to understand and to hear from our students around their experiences um, will help us to make decisions that um, should impact enrollment and retention in positive ways. So this is one data source for us. It can help inform and measure sense of belonging on campus. And uh, we will make, we will use this data to inform decisions. The overarching goal is to create and ma maintain learning and working environments that are supportive and respectful and where all have agency and voice. Still with um, strategy three, 3.4, to assist the universities in recruiting, developing and retaining high quality, diverse and innovative faculty and staff. Um, we have begun some of this work um, in partnership with our campuses and with our um, chief human resource officers, discussing ways to diversify staff, expanding some of our current recruitment efforts, casting a wide net, and continuing to express our commitment to equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, and there are a number of other ways that we've thought about being able to do this. Um, our immediate focus, um, however, right now is, the, the immediate focus between uh, myself and human resources is uh, developing a partnership and determining how uh, we're going to move forward to best honor the legislative agreement. And finally, I just want to share that again, or to restate that for students to be involved with diversity, for us to have equitable practices on our campuses, to ensure that we are including all students, benefits all students, it makes our campuses stronger, it um, validates us as a uh, competitive, as our institutions as competitive institutions, um, not only across the state of Wisconsin, but across the nation. Thank you, and I'm open for questions.
questions or comments from regents? Yes, Regent Underly. Thank you so much, Regent President Walsh. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, Associate Vice, Pres Vice President Smith. Since COVID, I've been thinking so much about this and how we need to redesign our delivery of um, educational services in K-12, but also certainly in higher ed and how we need to prioritize those high impact practices that you mentioned. Um, and also how we need to eliminate those practices that are entrenched that have not been helpful. And I just wanted to say that your presentation reminded me of one we heard earlier in audit committee. We do have some very good conversations in audit committee about these kinds of things, but it was about athletics and how students need different support to be successful and maybe it's mental health. Um, we're also having these conversations um, right now in the legislature around truancy of high school students and how they don't feel engaged and maybe it's something food insecurity or housing insecurity. So I just wanted to commend you for bringing these, um, these conversations to the forefront because it is really, it's super important. If the, if the students are going to be successful, we have to, as you said, talk to them and figure out what the, the issues are um, and we have a lot of work on our own to do to re redesign how we think about those supports for, for students. So thank you. Thank you. And I'll mention that high impact practices look different for different students, which is why it's important to understand the student and to recognize the complexities of their identities and to understand sometimes the transactional nature, right? There's a, if there's a student that finds themselves uh, underrepresented in a particular um, situation, it's likely that that part of their identity is going to kind of emerge and we need to know how to connect with students um, on a, in a variety of ways and to ensure again that they're having high impact practices across their uh, academic career. Thank you. Other question? Yes, Regent Vice President Bogus. Thank you, Regent President Walsh. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Smith. That was an excellent presentation, very informative. I think one of the messages that I got clearly was that this is all about partnerships too. You know, not one department can do this. This is a heavy lift and I think we're all responsible. So that you you highlighted that and I think it's really key because when, you know, we all do better, we all do better. Um, but I, I did have a question about the climate survey because I'm, I'm always um, fascinated by the data that comes through and um, you stress the importance of them. But in my experience, when I've talked to students years ago about you know, sexually uh, or gender-based violence, harassment, and I would ask them, you know, were you made it motivated to fill it out? Sometimes they're motivated because there's free pizza. And a lot of times they expressed that they were worried that even though it was anonymous, that they would be found out and there was retaliation. So they didn't want to say too much in the survey. And I know it's both, you know, um, check the box, but also give some feedback. So once you have that data, if you do have the you know correct data, I'm just curious what sometimes I've seen these, they they just never, years never move the needle. Mm -hmm. So I know you said they were important. I'm just curious, what do you do with the data? Can you get the right data? And if you can just inform me what what is going on with climate surveys as far as you're concerned. Yeah. So in 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 general, about with when we talk about climate surveys. First, we have to socialize students, right, to make sure that they're going to uh, participate in, in those those surveys. And certainly if they're incentivized, you certainly do get a, a better response rate from, from students. You use the data that you have. We assume that students are going to answer honestly. And we use that data to look at where there might be some sticking points and where we need to be able to do better. And um, being able to share with the campus, what the climate survey results are, not backing away from them, but recognizing that this makes us better, um, integrating that into our strategic aims or creating particular initiatives around that information to inform uh, not only the campus, but to also improve in that area for the students is, is really important. And then going back after some time, right, to continue to track the progress in those areas. So communication is, is really key. And then having um, action around that short term as well as long term goals and continuing to measure those goals and those benchmarks. Thank you. Let's see. Yes, Regent Adams. President Walsh. Um, 
I want to also echo, uh, Dr. Smith, the comments of my uh, fellow regents. I appreciate your work um, and the presentation today and really your approach regarding integration and collaboration. Um, that's going to be key in the success of this work. <clears throat> um, I do have a question, you know, as we talk about data and getting to some um, facts so that we understand the baseline of where we're starting from. Um, we know that what goes uh, unmeasured goes unnoticed. And so um, beyond the climate survey, which is really more uh, a, uh, a, a feeling, um, a, an expression, which is very important, um, but also when you think about this as an art and a science, the science of this work and really understanding it on, on your first slide, um, past your opening slide where we uh, outline in the model, the social identity characteristics, yes. um, even starting there and really understanding, do we have baseline data for each of the universities and you know from a system-wide lens of where we stand um, so that we can understand um, if and how we're moving the needle. Um, it, it's very important that as we talk about increasing access and improving rates, um, and, and we talk about recruiting and retention to really understand that holistically. Um, forgive me if I'm overlooking something, but I've, I've yet to have visibility to that data, and I'd like to be pointed into that, to that, um, pointed to it, or either uh, see it. And and with AT with the ATP project coming up, and you know, I'm wondering if there, if if you have the resources that you need to make sure there's integration there, so that this is lifted to that level of importance given our commitment um, to this in our strategic plan. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that we do collect some of this data. The, the more challenging pieces of data is that information that's gonna be optional, language use, LGBT, you know, those kinds of identity characteristics. We might not have, you know, full breadth of that. Um, I, I'm sure that our office that collects the data has a, has a lot of the data and we can synthesize that and be able to um, be able to respond uh, more completely. Yeah, thank you. I think in order for us to hold ourselves accountable to what we've committed to, there's no way we're going to be able to um, determine if we're doing that or not, if we do not have the appropriate um, data and baseline to start with. Regent Adams, I have to tell you, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, there's been a lot of talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion nationally, and I think people think it's a feel good thing to do, but it really is a science. Um, there really is theory. And when it's done consistently over time um, with intentionality, given an institution's culture and adequately um, resourced, we really can move the needle. In fact, I think that with respect to retention um, across the universities of Wisconsin, there was some movement prior to COVID, and then like many other institutions, those numbers went back. But we need to measure more than graduation, right? I, I want us to measure some of those pivotal areas to see where the challenges are, where students may be stopping out. And I'm not suggesting that we don't already measure that. I need to just be able to have some time to look at that and, and get a better idea of the of the landscape. Thank you. Thank you. Future amenities. Thank you. So thank you for the presentation. Um, you indicated that you were forming partnerships, which is good, and that the goal is to uh, move forward to honor the legislative agreement that, that this board made. Also, though, we made a, an agreement or a promise to, from the chancellors, from the regents, from the system president to honor the core values of PDI. So we, had, we may have competing interests. And uh, we also promised to reimagine the eye, even though it may not have that, that name, 
and to, to make it better, which are all good things. Uh, but I have to tell you that that meeting where those issues were discussed was one of the lowest points that I've ever been involved in on this work. And I'm still not feeling very good about that. So I can imagine that people that work in this area in our system, the students that are impacted by this in our system, probably aren't feeling all that welcome or good or secure or uh, hopeful about their role or their place in our campuses. So is there is there going to be an outreach to assure after you've made your plans and your partnerships and your agreements, is there going to be communication, transparency with the students about, yes, you're still here. Yes, we still care. Yes, we're still going to help you. Yes, you're a member of this community. And that will resonate maybe with other people who are coming in. But I want to know, are, are we having such a plan? Is there such a, a thing being thought of by our partnerships around the system? Thank you for that, Regent. Many deeds. I, I think that there are many um, across the system, not just students and not just, um, you know, certain identity, folks with certain identity characteristics uh, who have similar feelings that your feelings probably resonate with many people. Um, I think our students are, are waiting to see whether our articulation is more than articulation. And as we work to honor the agreement and we work to restructure what we need to, to restructure, um, certainly being able to, to talk about what that's going to look like is important. I will tell you that over the uh, short time that I've been here, um, leading through change and navigating the DEI space with campus leaders, um, through that ambiguity um, was a particular challenge. But those of us who have been in the space long enough recognize that every industry goes through some changes. And when you're in the DEI space, you generally look at the issues glass half full and you look for silver linings. And so I can say that there have been concerted efforts to, um, to look for the opportunities here and I think those of us who've been in this space long enough also recognize that there are opportunities. We also recognize that there are quite a few challenges. And so being able to thread that needle and to create some balance um, and to have the appetite and the stamina to continue to move forward as we are kind of um, creating this, this new, new path forward and developing that, it will take um, like-mindedness, it will take a lot of folks on our campuses across units to be able to do that. Um, but rest assured, we have continued to, to um, verbalize, to articulate the commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think there's some, uh, some folks who are holding their breath to see what does that look like. Thank you. And I just want to make sure that everyone understands that I'm not just talking about BIPOC or I'm not talking about minority groups. We're Absolutely. talking about underserved populations, okay. people that may live on farms, people with disabilities, people who come here from different countries. All of those people Absolutely. are in this group. It's not just one particular group or race that we're trying to assist in this. And I think we have to emphasize that also. And we're not okay. trying to marginalize or erase or do away with anybody because you know, that's not what this campus and what what this system is all about. So I just want to make it clear to anyone who might be listening to this that, that I'm talking about and caring about, as are you, everybody that comes here who needs a helping hand, or everybody that comes here who gets lonesome or gets lost or somehow is not able to, to continue. We're caring about all of those people with these kinds of programs. Absolutely. And those who are not underserved are, are wonderful allies in the work too, right? Those who don't necessarily see themselves benefiting in the same ways as those who are underserved do, their allies. This is a generation of students who um, care deeply about folks who have perceived or very real challenges. Not to monopolize you, but I absolutely agree with that. 
um, many, many students who, who are in school now care very much about, about other people and about how people perceive what they think about other people, way more than anybody that I grew up with. And so I am hopeful for the future and, and, and I'm glad that, that they're all out there working hard for the sense of Thank you. Uh, Dr. Smith, I wonder if I could ask you, um, one of the things that I'm thinking about a lot um, is that we've been trying a number of things over, say, the last 10 to 15 years. And it's quite apparent from looking at the numbers that the things we have tried are simply not working. Um, how are we identifying those things that aren't working? And are they politically, socially, culturally such that we can make the necessary change in, say, the worst offenders, what I what I don't want is for us to produce a feel good list of all the new programs or all the continuing programs we have when we can't say if it's working or not, or it's apparent from the numbers that they're not working. So um, the short answer is that I think we can take a look at what we're already doing on our campuses and we can take a look to, to determine where there are voids, where there's less access for the students who most need those uh, the access, um, taking a look at our high impact practices and seeing where our students are connected or not. Is there over-representation of a particular um, type of student in certain high impact practices and less representation of those students in other high impact practices? It's thinking about the pedagogies. Are they the ways that we're teaching, the ways that we're assessing student learning when we understand that there are multiple learning differences. When I think about what is necessary uh, for student success in higher education, there are three areas that come to mind, financial, uh, social, their sense of belonging on campus, and their academic abilities, the capabilities, and the resources that are necessary there. If there are deficits in any of those areas, our students are not going to be successful. So finding out where our students are stopping out and why they're stopping out is important. Exit interviews, if we have them, exit interviews will give us a lot of information and we'll know where to target our interventions. If we're finding that there are challenges between first and second year, what are the themes that we can respond to? So I think we need to do, and again, I'm not suggesting that these things have not already been done, uh, but in 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 the way that I think about it is we assess assess where the weaknesses are, where there's opportunities for change, and we begin to target our interventions there, recognizing that a cookie cutter model will not work for all of our students. Our student body is more diverse now than it has ever been. And we need to also take into account the COVID effect. Students are very different since COVID. We have students who finished the last two years of high school online, right? And so even our teaching strategies, those sorts of things. And this is why I said it's going to take folks from uh, multiple units across the institution to develop a plan to think about how we're going to restructure this and how we can be as effective or more effective than we've been in the past. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Regent Weatherly. Um, I would just like to very much echo and uh, co-sign what you just uh said region president and maybe add a little bit more. I, I'm looking at the stats right now. Um, among uh, black students, we have made no progress if you exclude non-Madison schools, or if you just if it's just non-Madison schools, we've lost Brown with Hispanic students in the last 10 years. And I do wonder, you know, rather than layering more programs or things on top of what we've done in the past. What, what is it we're going to stop doing or what is it we're going to amend? Because our progress the last 10 years, at least to my eyes, is unacceptable. We need to do better as an organization. Um, I don't know, as fresh eyes coming into the organization, I, I am very curious about, hey, what, the, what we've been doing the last 10 years, at least from a numbers perspective, has not had the output uh, or the the results that we would hope for, or frankly, that Wisconsin deserves. So where are the opportunities for us to, to shed things that perhaps weren't as effective 
and add new things. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just um, share something I said a little bit earlier, an intersectional approach to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion causes us to look at the entire student. And so while you mentioned the black student, I would wanna know what are the other characteristics of that student? Are they also a first gen student? Are they also a student that is a low income student? Is this a student with disabilities, right? I wanna see the entire profile of that student because while this might be a black student, there may be other areas, right, that, um, that are points of weakness. And I don't mean weakness in terms of the student's capability, I mean points of disconnect between that student and the institution. Um, I think we sometimes make a mistake when we just identify one identity characteristic, especially with our black and brown students. And given our history that uh, there are some who think that black and brown students don't have the same capabilities or the capacities that non-Hispanic white students do. And this is why it's important to see the multiple elements, the multiple identities of a student, um, because this may be a student who doesn't feel a sense of belonging because they're underrepresented because of race. But the real issue for that student might be that they're having difficulty financially, or the real issue might be, or additional issue, might be that the student has a learning disability and they didn't bring an IEP from higher ed or from K through 12. And so they're not getting the services that they need. There may be some other challenges at home. There are all sorts of things that make up the entire student. And so that's what I would wanna look at. This is what I'm saying. We need to be able to take a critical look and critically assess um, the students and look for the themes that are across um, across the student body, right? Are, are we having more, um, more students that are dropping out in their second year? Is it their third year? Is it a particular major? There's a lot of, we've got to mine the data and then be able to make decisions around that. And I think if or when new programs or new initiatives are, uh, when there are proposals made for new programs or new initiatives, it has to be based on the data that we have that tells us that these are areas, these are issues, hindrances to student success. And, and this deeper dive looking at more of the whole student or the complexities of the student, how, when can, should we anticipate actually having a better understanding of that? Oh, geez. I mean, that's, <laughs> um, I okay, don't want to- hear you say, we need to understand this. this yeah. Start to take action, we need to have a better understanding. So if step one is having a better understanding. It means to start looking at that data, look at the data that we're collecting and beginning to assess that data. And I can't tell you a date sitting here today. I think I would probably give it too ambitious of a date, but it certainly is a priority for us to look at that. If we're going, if we're saying st student success um, is a priority, then we have to understand those particular barriers and that's what we need to do um, and, and we'll begin to do. Thank you. Okay, Regent Adams. Um, thank you, Madam President. Um, this is, suffice it to say, a very complex matter. And, you know, certainly not, um, Dr. Smith, to, you know, have you on a hot seat. I think we owe you uh, better direction, clarity of our vision around this work. And I think our strategic plan is an excellent starting place. Um, but I, I agree there's um, intersectionality in terms of um, you know, the, uh, the student themselves and then the groups that, um, the, the broader groups that we find ourselves in as human beings and then the individuality. Um, so, you know, we are having conversations um, around our structural deficits and having to make some very tough decisions. And we're making investments in those spaces to give us insight into what we need to do. And I, um, when we talk about student success, I think this is critically important that we take a similar approach um, in the sense of whatever we need to do to, you know, get the data to tell us, you know, where we stand. But also, there's a question of where do we need to double down? because we cannot boil the ocean. 
it is too complex of an issue to do that. And if we're trying to be all things to all people at one time, when we haven't even figured out a very obvious aspect to this work, um, then we're doomed from the start. So I think that we've got to get some clarity around what is it that we are exactly trying to do and um, you know, create a model of success from there. Um, so I just wanted to pull back some of the um, focus on um, um, you having all of the answers. I don't think that they're gonna all come from you. I think there's some more soul searching um, that this board needs to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. I think that's the end of our questions. Dr. Smith, we really appreciate your time and attention to this and look forward to hearing future updates from you and your work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our, thank you. That concludes our open session business. Regent Vice President Bogus, would you read the resolution to go into closed session? I move that the Board of Regents move into closed session to consider personal histories related to a name in a UW Madison as by statute 19.85, print one paramount with this council statute and consider performance evaluation of cancer submitted by section 19.85, parent one, parent C of this council statute. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Second. Uh, please call the roll. Regent Adams? I vote. We need a. Yes. She said yes. I didn't need Regent Adams? She said yes. Yes. Thank you. Regent Atwell? Regent Bogus? Thank you. Regent Frankis? Yes. Regent Colon? Uh, he just left yeah. the room. Okay. Regent Doe? Nope, we can't hear you. Yes, sir. Boozer? Aye. Yes. Regent Many Deeds? Regent Many Deeds. Regent Many Deeds. Yeah. Regent Many Deeds? Yes. Okay. Regent Miller. Yes. Regent Peterson. <laughs> Regent yeah. Prince. Brian. Yes. Peterson. Thank you. Regent Rice. Yes. Regent Staten. Yes. Thank you. Regent Tyler. Regent Tyler. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Regent Underly. Regent Underly. Yes. Regent Wax. Yes. Wax. Regent Walsh. Yes. And Regent Weatherly. 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 Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Oh gosh. Okay. This is. Okay. These things.